What's up, YouTube? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back here with another laser disc update video. It's been quite some time since I've dropped one of these, probably March of this year. So, over the past few months, uh, thanks to the kindness of a few people that I know online from Facebook groups, etc., I've picked up some new titles and Along the way, I've actually tripped across a few in the wild as well, which was nice. And I do have a box on its way bobbing across the ocean right now, coming from the Good Squid. So look for that in a couple of weeks, probably. Uh, in the meantime, i got to you know, get right back on the horse and show you what I've been picking up over the past few months. And uh, the first thing was an upgrade. I had a gorgeous copy, mind you, but it was an older um, 1.33 to 1 version of... Tim Burton's Beetlejuice and me and Moiki from, you know, ex Laser Discotech podcast and from some of the Facebook groups are always talking about how we love later AC3 reissues of films from, you know, 97 or 98 usually they dropped. And this one was 1998. Yeah, Tim Burton's Beetlejuice. And I watched this the night I got it. Sounded great. Yeah, nice and full and good 5.1. And uh, the picture was, was nice. Yep. Pretty much, uh, I think, the same transfer they used on the early uh, Snapper Case DVD, which I do. I have that as well. Then, of course, you know there's got to be a couple Bond titles in here, so bear with it. I think there's only like three or four. Uh, but believe it or not, I never had a bunch of the uh, original uh, films in the Bond series the uh, series that they put out in the late 80s and 90s with yeah, Bond written on the side and the gold banner on the top. Uh, the the only uh, caveat with these is not all of them are in uh, letterbox condition. The only one of the of the non-anamorphic you know, 2.35 to 1 films that's letterboxed, I believe, is Live and Let Die. And all the other ones are the Connery classics or the more classics. That's how you know they're not uh, there's probably a little bit of pan and scanning involved, uh, because I do believe, at least with these films, they were hard matted. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the matting ratio for that was, if it was 1.66 to 1 or something, uh, lesser, and then obviously over matted beyond that, depending on where it was, uh, exhibited. Um, so yeah, so there's definitely going to be some image loss. The other weird thing about these two is, uh, there's that, that weird concept, I guess it's futuristic for pixelated imagery <laughs> like maybe that's like yeah dr knows dossier picture is super pixelated yeah uh, i guess that makes it look cool or something like that so kind of weird artwork i mean i love the the painted stuff which is uh very similar to the criterion collection release which is great by the way uh so i had to finally get that and the other one that i was missing from that collection is goldfinger again heavy pixelation there and then this uh, photo of uh Goldfinger tormenting Bond with the laser looks like it was a run through an early Photoshop filter. <laughs> Pretty cheesy stuff, but these were in really good condition. They were either all new or still, you know, sealed in the shrink with the side split open. And the the one I was really excited about was uh, this release from the later 1993 reissue series, which stalled out. They didn't actually release all the films. Uh, maybe six or so. And then, again, they tried later with the THX versions. But this is uh, from Usher Would Love. The cool thing about the series is uh, they used the poster art for the most part for the covers. And then on the back, you know, it's got this really nice kind of gold and black motif. So they're, they're classy discs for sure. They look pretty good too. Uh, interestingly, later when Japan reissued the THX films or issued them, in THX versions, they use this artwork, but in the States, these were, you know, pre-THX versions, and the THX versions have the same art that you'd see on, like, the, almost the same art as on the DVDs later on. Uh, so that's it for James Bond material. Also, uh, picked up a couple things when I was in Boston, uh, maybe three or so months ago. I tripped across a few discs in a, uh, record store and figured I'd have a go at them. Uh, this one is a Dolby Digital release, and I didn't have it. Randall Wallace's The Man in the Iron Mask. The only uh, sad thing is at this point, MGM was uh, cheaping out and just uh, putting two discs in one big pocket. No uh, no gatefold action. But I figured I'd grab it anyways. 
And the other one my wife wanted to grab and it was in great condition. Uh, both of these still had the shrink on them with the hype stickers and everything. It's got a little bit of a side blowout here, but not too bad. Mr. Holland's Opus. This one is also an AC3. Dolby Digital. Uh, Disney Touchstone Action. Or is it Disney or Hollywood? Oh, Hollywood Pictures. Again, cheaping out with the uh, lack of a gatefold, but the price was right. Then uh, I got a bunch of hand-me-downs from uh, Peter B. and Cardi. Shoutouts to Peter, who had uh, bought a big mystery box uh, for the, the the big kind of Illinois swap meet that did sort of happen, but not as originally planned. See my last video for laser drama. And uh, so he you know showed me what he had picked up and offered, you know, obviously what he wasn't going to keep up for sale to a, a bunch of us and uh the usps did not like that they they had a grudge apparently against the uh the soul situation and they decided to eat these discs uh i mean i actually banged these kind of back into semi shape but it clearly looks like the box uh got sucked into something on a conveyor belt or whatever and there's like actual like machinery chewage on the jackets there they really ganked these things so i did kind of i got a you know chisel and uh, all and and a hammer and i just went at them uh, but yeah this is okay because it's a beater copy anyways just for fun the japanese uh terminator 2 judgment day you know the jacket's super worn anyways uh just got it just to get it and there's a gatefold discs okay though uh despite the fact that they got really ganked by the post office uh no no disc crackage at all believe it or not Despite the considerable stress these things look like they were put under. Uh, this is an Oliver Stone film that I had meant to check out. I always wanted to uh, take a gander at. Uh, never did, though. A 93 film, 94 disc, Japanese pressing of Heaven and Earth with Tom Lee Jones and Joan Chen. Not to be confused with the really good uh, Japanese period piece film, Heaven and Earth, which is... Uh, you know, it's not quite an action film. It's more of like a period drama with bouts of, of uh, warfare action. But uh, that's really good stuff. And this does have a gatefold. Uh, sadly, uh, this one got bent up a little bit too. Uh, the discs uh, worked fine because I watched this in the night. I got it and oh my god, it's gorgeous. Um, but yeah, the top corner here is pretty wrecked. But uh, Mononoke Hime, also known as Princess Mononoke, it's Hayao Miyazaki film that's a little bit different than the rest of the titles in his uh, oeuvre because it's got a little bit more, you know, like historical violence and, and yeah, a little bit over top violence too because uh, not one of the characters is bestowed with some rage from a forest god that uh you know gives him superhuman strength with shooting arrows and uh literally just like pops people's heads off and arms etc uh so yeah a little bit uh gorier and and you know not quite as kid friendly as totoro or some of those older films uh did come with this insert that was manhandled uh pretty heavily but yeah then and one of the other damaged discs is uh, a mono 1984 version, but still nice to have. I do believe this is Letterbox, though, if I remember correctly. Um, and, oh, the AC3 track on Mononoke is amazing, because I just watched the the G-Kids version on Blu-ray recently, and uh, that was like the theatrical mix AC3. It was just beefy and powerful. Uh, but, yeah, this is mono but uh the cover art is so cool in effect it kind of uh the stylization of the the pen marks and everything kind of hides a lot of the stress fractures and usps damage on here but uh nausicaa and the valley of the wind uh, love film love this film i saw it originally when it was repackaged as warriors of the wind over here on cable and then uh became aware of its origins a little bit later so it's nice to have a copy on ld and we're almost out of Miyazaki territory. Though we're going a little bit older. This one escaped the wrath of the post office. 
doesn't have an OB strip or anything, but it looks great. I watched it already. It is Castle of Cagliostro. Little loop in the third action. Really fun romp. And uh, looks fantastic. They actually showed this in uh, theaters not too long ago, too. Uh, sadly, I didn't get a chance to go see it. Got this just to get it. It's a beater copy. No OB strip or anything like that. But, you know, eventually I'll get a Primo one. I'm not sure why. Uh, but, you know, I can bring this one to work or something like that. We can laugh at uh, JJ's wackiness. But yes, it is Star Wars The Phantom Penis. And, uh, yeah, you've probably seen this a thousand times. It's pretty common here in the States, so I'll, I'll get a nice one with OB Strip for like 20 bucks at some point. Again, not sure why, but I will. Uh, and then I got this just to get it, different artwork. Um, again, no OB or anything like that, but it is uh, one of my favorite films. So, yeah, why not get it in a multiple version and see if the transfer is any different? Not that the American transfer is wanting, but uh, it would be interesting to see if this is also raised up on the screen as the image was on the American release of Michael Mann's Heat. Uh, it's funny, uh, people always talk about how amazing the uh, Japanese artwork is uh, on Laserdisc, and a lot of times... Uh, the, the cover art that's so amazing is just the European theatrical poster art. <laughs> uh, it just looks so different to us in America because, you know, we had, you know, that pretty much as our poster art. Uh, but having, you know, poured over pretty much every issue of Empire Magazine in the 90s religiously, I, I recognize most of these as the uh, European or UK quad posters. But it's cool just to have some alternate artwork. And this I grabbed... I don't believe it's widescreen, uh, but I do have the Blu-ray that Shout Factory put out recently. But it's been a, a big hit in the household. Everyone's kind of uh, reconnected uh, with it, and the soundtrack was uh, playing quite a bit in the uh, in the Hatch House. But Walter Hill's Streets of Fire, uh, pretty cool cover art. Had to get that. And... Actually, I do owe oh, a really, really late re review on that <laughs> Blu-ray. I should do that at some point. This I I was meant to meant to check out. This was supposed to be like DreamWorks' like big killer app in '97 when they were becoming a thing, um, but everyone kind of forgot about it pretty quickly. I remember living in L.A. at the time, and there was you know building-sized um, ads for this thing all over the place, but. The Peacemaker with Clooney and Kidman. Again, this kind of slid through the cracks and is on nobody's list of favorite films. Uh, but, again, it fits the, the modus operandi for my collecting LEDs for the most part. I want to get, like, 90s kind of big, dumb action movies and things like that that I should have ponied up the dough to go see back in the day, but didn't for whatever reason. I'm guessing I was traveling or something when this came out. Uh, this I had a love-hate relationship with. I've warmed to it since. Uh, it's still, you know, pretty obnoxious when you think about it, but it's got some great people involved in it, including Shane Black and John McTiernan directing. Uh, but Zach Penn and Adam Leff uh, did the original thing, and it was kind of a big, uh, the original story, and it was a big thing uh, in my neck of the woods because they were college kids from Connecticut, and, you know, they made big with this and then it had it pretty much taken away from them uh and it's uh full of winking at the camera postmodernism which you know when done well is is pretty cool fight club uh when done annoyingly and and with a, a annoying kid uh you get the last action hero but it's got charles dance in it yeah you know, tom noonan it's got a lot going for it it's got a killer soundtrack uh it's really really cheesy but the American release, while it does have a gorgeous uh, gatefold, is uh, usually pressed by Sony DADC USA and prone to rot. So I forget when I got the Japanese one. Watched it. Looks great. Glad to have it. Uh, this is another one of those uh, European art uh, covers, but I forget I get it. It looks so different than the American one, which is ubiquitous and isn't everybody's collection. You can see it right there. It is Mel Gibson's Braveheart. Uh, I'm sure you know, the transfer is just about the same, and it's probably got the same AC3 Dolby Digital track. It's THX. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that in a while, actually. I should fire that up again. And the opening bit of that thing, 
that was like a surround sound test disc du jour in my basement system all the time just yeah the camera flying over the uh the mountains and uh, the, the the like icon image with the the strings kind of going on must have seen slash heard that like a thousand times back in the day Oh, what year was this? 94. I remember I wanted to check this out in the theaters, but did not. So again, it fits my criteria for picking up discs. Uh, I, I break that criteria on a regular basis whenever I get something I want. But uh, this is a strangely, uh, again, low resolution kind of graphic and then a pretty digitized background. But at a distance, it looks pretty good. Uh, Color of Night. Some Bruce Willis sexiness going on. I don't know if that makes it more sexy when I say sexiness. Probably not, but there you go. I can finally see that. This, uh, again, looks pretty low resolution, uh, the poster art on the front. Somehow never picked up, uh, this is a common in the States, but I did uh, rent it on VHS a long time ago, and uh, probably haven't seen it since, but 1996 film, Barry Levinson's Sleepers, some intense stuff. And I do have the the domestic version of this, thanks to uh, Monkey Boyd, or Moiki, shout out to Moiki, uh, Rot Free, it's usually a rotter, but uh, I forget this is a nice release, uh, and it's got the Obi strip and everything. Wolfgang Peterson's In the Line of Fire, and good supporting cast, good main cast, solid flick. I also have the domestic of this, but the jacket's pretty beat, and I don't think it was a gatefold like this one is, so this is a nice little surprise. Dolby Digital, and this is, I believe, the same longer version that was released here. States add on Laserdisc, 140 minutes of Ransom, Ron Howard's flick. I remember being actually pretty underwhelmed by this when I saw it in theaters. I was expecting, you know, you know Mad, <laughs> Mad Max and anger, uh, so I thought, like him getting his kid taken was going to be a lot more like a film that I saw years later called Taken. So imagine you're going to a movie theater to see Taken. You just don't know it exists yet. And then you see this and you're like, eh, it's kind of weak sauce. Um, I'll give it a shot again and I'm intrigued to see the extra footage. Maybe that will revise my take on it. Uh, this is a TV movie apparently from 1990. Uh, Peter brought my attention to it and was like, this is a Sam Hatch special. And I'm like, alright, sure, let's go for it. Uh, it's a Frederick Forsyth thing. Looks like a political thriller. Uh, it's not available on other home media, so it might be on VHS, but uh, yeah. So it's kind of forgotten about. I figured let's check it out. Why not? Death has a bad reputation. I love the artwork. It looks like some sort of like Taiwanese uh, karaoke disc or something like that. But uh, no, it's a 1990 uh, TV movie. We'll see. Uh, this one, I haven't seen this in a while either. I forget it was uh, pretty much brand new, widescreen to boot, and uh, good cast. Young Brendan Fraser in School Ties. This is a weird anomaly. I got it uh, just to see if it was different than the um, the Fox widescreen version that came out here in the states that uh, has a really cool soundtrack but the video is kind of eh, iffy i thought man hey, maybe the japanese one is better and eventually i'll get the thx one but i got this weird mongrel concoction the widescreen diehard but if you own the japanese widescreen diehard you'll know that the artwork has a kind of reddish uh border uh, within the artwork and this does not so what we have here is a uh, obi strip from the later widescreen issue of the film and the disc is the old crappy pan and scan version so bleh. but on the plus side see good and bad if i ever do get a version of the widescreen and it needs an obi strip i got that covered so zang uh, i know there's a box set of these and i should probably just pick that up uh, but this was available. It was brand new. THX. It's actually a really, really dark uh, picture. So even more than the usual, you know, darkness from having uh, Japanese IRE Zero um, discs. But so you really got to crank up the uh, 
crank up the brightness a little bit. But I freaking why not get it? Uh, it is Tony Scott's sequel, Beverly Hills Cop 2. I hadn't seen it in a while. I watched this right away, and it's still a lot of fun. You know, some of Axel's antics are a little, a little hokey and unbelievable, but still fun. And this I got just because, yeah, the, the jacket art is gorgeous. Uh, came with the Obi strip. I do believe it is the theatrical cut, 141 minutes, uh, so it's not the special edition, but it is a 1994 pressing Japanese release of The Abyss. Yeah, can't have enough James Cameron discs, right? It's just like a unwritten law of laser disc collection. All right. And this um, does not have the obi, but the jacket is pristine and really, really nice artwork. In fact, even if I get this on you know high def or something, I'm never giving this up. Uh, and this, I believe, is a longer cut, 227 minutes. Sergio Leone is Once Upon a Time in America. Very nice. This goes up there with uh, the most gorgeous art for a Japanese uh, laser disc. Uh, the film I was pretty lukewarm on. Um, when it hit theaters, I might have to check it again. Mike Nichols films in general really are hit and miss with me. And this one was almost hit for a little bit there, but yeah, I'll check it out again. But the the jacket art is killer. Wolf. Again, I do believe that was used in uh, European marketing as opposed to art. Uh, backside, gorgeous. Uh, this is up there with, it's got this kind of matte finish too. And when you feel it, just oh, awesome. I love the, the kind of gold obi strip too, how that kind of interacts with it. It's up there with uh, the Japanese jacket for Ed Wood with one of my favorites. But uh, I'll give it another shot. And uh, then I was out flea marketing and I happened to trip across a couple laser discs and a bin of vinyl. And it's funny, uh, occasionally that happens. And for the most part, it's usually stuff I already have in comments. But this time I saw deluxe letter box edition and i knew by the font uh it was a later one it was like 97 or 98 mgm title and sure enough this is uh i believe 97 so i forget i had to get it vincent price and diana rig in theater of blood it's really really nice disc so that was a, a no-brainer the rest of them were the usual star wars is and yeah commons etc uh and then vincent onorati was selling a bunch of Japanese discs, mostly French films, etc., and a couple of other random domestics. And I figured I'd pick up a couple from them. So shout outs to Vincent. This is one of those films I've always wanted to see. It's probably the only Luc Besson film I hadn't seen up until maybe some of his more recent stuff. Uh, I, I, you know, of course, seen his last two or three movies, but uh, but the, yeah, this is a 1985 film in uh, French. So no subtitles, except for Japanese subtitles, but yeah, whatever. Uh, I kind of know the, the basic score of it. Uh, so I watched this Subway. So uh, one of the uh, Cinema du Luc entries, uh, kind of compared with Diva and Betty Blue and a number of other films that were kind of celebrating style over substance in French cinema. And uh, it's got the usual kind of Luc Besson kind of goofy humor, etc. Uh, it's got Jean Reno in it, Christophe Lambert, Isabella Johnny, John Hinglad, and uh, yeah, it's nice. Really, really nice. It's fun. I like that stuff. I'm a, I'm an apologist for Luc Besson. So. Uh, speaking of Jean Hinglad, uh, this is a film that kind of rode the coattails of Pulp Fiction. Uh, it was a big seller on Laserdisc here in the States. Sadly, I don't know if there's a letterboxed version of this thing, but uh, I had to get this, I like the artwork, it's a little beat, but who cares? No Obi strip, but who cares? Eric Stoltz also and Julie Delby in Killing Zoe. And uh, Roger Avery co-wrote a bunch of stuff with uh, Quentin Tarantino, especially the uh, Gold Watch segment of Pulp Fiction, for which they shared an Oscar for the screenplay. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this was a kind of big uh, commodity in the... Quentin Tarantino feeding frenzy. Uh, this, man, one of my favorite films, and believe it or not, I don't own it on Laserdisc. The artwork is kind of eh, but it's a letterbox version, and yeah, I had to have it. And I know Vincent's a fan, and 
I'm surprised he was selling it. He probably had mul multiple copies of it. But Robert Altman's The Long Goodbye. Uh, if you're also a fan of Cowboy Bebop, check this out, because Spike Spiegel is pretty much uh, lifted from Elliot Gould's Philip Marlowe in this, uh, mixed with, obviously, a couple other characters and, and actors. Uh, but it's a great film. Uh, Rob Daltman was in this kind of like deconstructionist phase when he was taking apart things like the American Western and film noir and etc. So this one he was kind of also critically casting his gaze on uh, 70s Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. So I know a lot of fans of the original Raymond Chandler story. Um, not so thrilled about it, but pff, man, love it. Amazing film. Uh, ever since I started uh, actively collecting LDs again, this has been near the top of my list, and like an idiot, I haven't picked it up yet until now. Uh, I have a VHS copy that I enjoyed. I remember this getting hit by critics, but I always uh, thought it was pretty fascinating. Uh, Steven Soderbergh's Kafka with Jeremy Irons. Oh, Laser Discotech fans, who is Kafka? It's going out for you. Uh, <laughs> I love that it's got a little letter from Steven Soderbergh on there saying about how when he can finally sit down and enjoy the Letterbox Laserdisc copy, that's when he knows the you know cycle of filmmaking is complete and he can actually enjoy the film for the first time. Uh, again, you know, it goes to show how important Laserdiscs were to um, you know cinema creators back in the day. And finally, wrapping things up with another title I can't believe I don't own on LD. It's in a really nice condition, too. Uh, it's usually listed as a router. There's multiple pressings of this thing, though. Uh, supposedly this one's rot-free. I don't know. Vincent might have lied to me. We'll find out. Uh, I had to take a gamble anyways, just because, uh, yeah, the jacket's really, really pretty. And it's my favorite David Lynch film. We're talking about Lost Highway. And I've got many copies on DVD, but yeah, strangely, nothing on Laserdisc. I don't have the Japanese copy either. Uh, but it was worth uh, worth grabbing that sucker. So thanks to Vincent for sending those out. And uh, thanks again to Peter for hustling those other uh, Japanese discs over his way and then bouncing them back my way. So now i got plenty of stuff to watch. I've been tearing through these as quickly as possible. Anyways, thanks for hanging out and uh, checking out the goods. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to be in the New England area uh, next month, but in early September, I'm going to be back at the Retro World Expo doing some Laserdisc uh, demonstrating, and I'm going to have a table where I'll hang out at and talk to people on Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be on September 8th and 9th, and then on the 9th, I'll be doing my Laserdisc panel in the afternoon. So uh, stop on by and check that out. If you saw it last year, I'm going to actually kind of evolve it a little bit this year, too, and add in some more visuals and uh, mix it up a little bit so it's not the, just the same thing rehashed again. So that means i got to get to work on it, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, that should be really fun. So yeah, check out uh, RetroWorldExpo.com, I believe, is the website. You can get all the info on there and the panel schedule, etc. I had a great time last year. Just you know, Even just hanging out on the floor chatting with people about Laserdisc was really cool, and I'm hoping to do so again this year. So uh, that's about it. I'll uh, see you guys on the flip side. Going to do some more uh, Blu-ray reviews, etc., and uh, get up to date. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys again soon here. Enjoy. Peace.